recording this. Okay. It's okay. Oh, I'm on. <laughs> you Hi, are. everybody. In my <laughs> last official act as program chair, I'm going to um, share a little bit with you about Heidi Scheiber. Um, she um, taught German for 30 years and worked as a teacher naturalist for Peace Valley Nature Center, but now she's focusing um, on advocating for the environment and is especially passionate about native plants and habitat restoration for birds and wildlife in the overall ecosystem. As a member of Bucks Audubon's board and also board president, she helped recreate their advocacy committee, re reinvigorate the board and establish um, renewable energy as a focus. She's remained active at Bucks Audubon, but serving as the at the committee level, as well as continuing to lead their book club. Um, she also serves on Doyle's Town Townships Environmental Advocacy Committee, something like that, Advisory and committee. coordinate their Bird Town program, and is also <clears throat> a Bucks County uh, Penn State Master Gardener and serves as secretary of the Pennsylvania Audubon Council. Um, for the past for the past two years, she's been working to reinvigorate, strengthen, and grow the statewide bird town program and ensure it's sustainable for years to come. So here you go, Heidi. It's all yours. Oh, Mary, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Let me go ahead and share my screen, and then let me get my presentation up and ready to go here. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited that all of you are here and have an interest in our Birdtown, Pennsylvania program. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the program tonight and um, some of the highlights, some of the work that we're doing, some things about our website and, and so on. And you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them at the, begin at the end of the evening. Um, I always like to start with our mission because um, I think it's important to always stay focused with that. So Birdtown, Pennsylvania works in partnership with local municipalities. So that includes like townships and boroughs throughout the state. And we also work with like-minded organizations like Audubon chapters, We Can Serve PA, um, Land Conservancies, and so on. And we all work together to promote community-based conservation actions to create a healthier, more sustainable environment for birds, wildlife, and people. So Birdtown has been actively engaging with municipalities in Pennsylvania for more than 10 years. It originated as a vehicle for supporting the Bird Habitat Recognition Program. So it came out of Audubon at Home from National Audubon Society and Steve Safier, who was the founder of the program and is on our board, um, he created this program to actually highlight the Bird Habitat Recognition Program, to amplify that program, to really get people you know, doing things in their own yards um, to improve habitat. And obviously the program has evolved to be much more than that. So currently we have 41 bird towns and nine counties in the state. Um, they are primarily in um, the southeast part of the state, but we're looking to grow. Uh, I was just out in Carlisle um, last night. Um, that's out towards Harrisburg meeting with them. And there's a, a number of municipalities out there that are interested in joining bird town. So we're super excited about that. And I hope, you, you know, having this meeting tonight with you guys and this presentation that will generate some interest in the Erie area as well. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention we have um, 16 different municipalities applying right now. So there's a lot of interest in Birdtown, and we're super excited about that. So we are under the PA Audubon Council. On the PA, um, PA Audubon Council is, um, has 21 Audubon chapters, which are all the chapters in the state, and their purpose is to serve the chapters and advocate for conservation and preservation of birds and other wildlife and the environment on which they depend. And they do this through the sharing of resources and ideas among and between the chapters in collaboration with other conservation partners. So we're right underneath their, their umbrella. Um, they serve as our fiscal agent, and they actually own the program. Um, PAC is a 501c um, organization, so it's a nonprofit. And so we're working with PAC and the Audubon Chapter Network to establish our bird towns across Pennsylvania. So what our program does is we focus on engaging, educating, encouraging, and supporting. So we're doing this engaging our municipal leaders as well as engaging at the ground level in the local communities on um, the residents and community members. And so we do all sorts of different things. We have an inspiration list that has like 100 different things that municipalities can be doing to engage with the residents. This is just a few things um, like holding native plant pop up gardens and sales, installing demonstration native plant pollinator and rain gardens 
educating about invasive plants and running workshops for the removal, <clears throat> reducing bird window strikes and pesticide use, working with schools to engage and educate and so on. So as we go through, I'm gonna give you some more examples of what we do. So our goal is to connect more people to nature through bird related activities and ecological landscape practices and networking. We really wanna improve general ecological literacy and I'm gonna expand about on that at the next slide. We also inspire municipal level change to create a more livable community and really encourage grassroots innovation and involvement and sharing across the communities. So what I mean by improving ecological knowledge is really you know, making sure that people really understand that important relationship between native plants, insects and birds. So I don't know how much all of you know, but I just thought this was an important point to make, you know, that native plants are the basis for our ecosystem and food web and all those seeds, nuts and berries and nectar that they create is so nutritious and, and always well timed for the um, for wildlife and um, unlike those non natives. And it's really important too that native plants have co-evolved with the insects that are their primary food for most birds like 85% of birds um, eat insects and they feed them to their babies. They also provide important shelter and support for them. So they're the host plants of many caterpillars and moss. And so as we all know, um, or, or maybe not, from the University of Delaware, Doug Tallamy did a lot of research and the information that he found has been just brown, you know, groundbreaking like 15 years ago or 16 years ago. And what he found was that white oaks, our native oaks, support over 500 different caterpillar species compared to the non-native ginkgo tree, which only supports five species. And so, you know, with his more research, he realized it takes actually 6,000 caterpillars, even up to 9,000 caterpillars to raise one brood of chickadees. So I've been trying to put this into perspective for children because I you know, work with children too. So if you line up each caterpillar that's about an inch long, tail to tail, that's actually two football lengths um, long, you know, of little caterpillars lined up. So those poor mamas, you know, and mama and daddy birds, they have so much work to do to get all those um, caterpillars and feed their brood. So that's just, I think it's really important to have that visual of how much work these um, poor birds have to do to just raise one brood. And so it's so important to impart that to residents to let them know that they re we really need all everyone's help to get those native plants in the ground in our, um, you know, our, our yards as well as in our parks and so on. Um, they just recent information came out, I was reading that he said it takes actually 70 to 80 percent of a habitat to have native plants to be sustainable. So it's not a sink. It's actually a place that can support the birds. So these are the kind of information that we're trying to impart to our residents across Pennsylvania. So for municipalities, this is what we offer a municipality. So we're a statewide structured program. We offer concrete resources and achievable actions. We have a beautiful website, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. And we provide a framework for communities to network with other bird towns and conservation partners. And we include a number of avenues of communication, events, volunteer opportunities, and citizen science projects. We offer bird town leader training and workshops, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. We also provide opportunities to expand into diverse communities and also increase opportunity and success in obtaining funding. So I just wanna give you an idea of some of the workshops that we had um, this past year. Um, our first one was, was invigorating and strengthening our program. Actually the program had fallen fallow for about three years. It wasn't really getting enough attention and support. So um, once we took over the program, from Audubon PA. Um, Audubon PA actually became um, a regional office with Maryland and um, DC. And when that happened, they decided to no longer support the program, sadly. Um, but there were a number of us who were very passionate about the program. So we took the program on and we're leading the program now under PA Audubon Council, like I mentioned before. So our very first workshop was to really invigorate our program and get all those bird towns that were in place and really get them up and running again. Um, we also did one on backyard habitat programs, how to actually run a pop-up garden. A lot of people don't know what that means. Um, advocate for proclamations and resolutions and ordinances, talk about bird window collisions and how to impart that information. And then also just how to talk with municipal leaders. You know, um, a lot of people feel intimidated to talk to their mayor or talk to their board of supervisors. So we really want to have our birds on um, leaders feel really empowered you know, have that knowledge of how it's structured and how to talk with them. So that was a really awesome workshop. So this is the kind of leader um, um, training that we're providing for our bird town leaders. So they feel empowered and they can really have an impact in their communities. So this is a website that we created when we came on, when we took over the program. Um, it include, includes a lot of resources, the list of our bird towns, the list of our conservation partners. It has a blog. And then we also have a back page, a special back page that are just for the bird town leaders. And this um, area it provides contact lists for the program as well as other programs like Penn State Extension offices, um, watershed associations, and so on. 
Also for those workshops and meetings, we have all the recordings and supplementary materials in that area as well. So I'm just gonna jump on real quick. Well, hopefully this will work. Um, just take you to my web, to the website real quick, but this is what it looks like. Um, this is a female red belly woodpecker, um, you know, which is great, has our mission, talks about what we do, but at the very top is really the key here. This is where the bird towns are listed, but this is our resource area here. So there's a whole section on community science, um, plant management about native plants, invasive plants, pesticides, keeping birds safe, how to work with HOAs, which are so challenging, stormwater management, recommended reading activities for kids and so on. So I really encourage you after um, the meeting tonight to jump on our website and see if there's anything that we can provide uh, information for you. Since we're, I'm here, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, jump on this part. This is a particular area that um, we especially think is important. This is our backyard habitat programs. So I really advocate for 10 different ones. We have the Audubon bird friendly habitat. That's you know originally what we started with, but one size doesn't fit all. There's some folks that might wanna focus on um, pollinators like their monarchs and really focus on that in their yard. Or maybe they wanna focus on butterflies. So they might wanna um, look into this program and see what they can do to enhance their yard to in, support the habitat for um, butterflies. Or maybe they have a water, um, water um, aspect of their yard. Maybe they have a creek running through their yard or maybe they have um, a pond. So this program would be really, it's a really um, excellent program. They can evaluate it. They need to get a score of at least 85%. And it addresses things like pesticides, um, you know, are there invasives, is there dog waste and so on. And you have to go through the whole program, the whole um, application to see if your property is, is, can be certified or not. If it doesn't pass, then you have to, you know, re remediate and it gives you some guidance for that. So in any case, there's 10 different programs um, that we advocate for here and encourage people to sign up for. And then you have something like the Pollinator Pathway or Xerces Society, which is just really signing a pledge. And what's also very nice about these programs is they all provide signage. So at the very top here um, of this section, it talks about why, why signage is so important. Signage is really critical because it communicates to people what you're doing. So if you do have a yard that you're adding natives or putting a water feature in, your neighbors might be curious of like, what's going on? What are they doing this for? So if you have a little sign up, it creates a, an opportunity for people to come and talk to you about it. They might say, oh, this is an interesting sign. Or if they're too shy, they can just look it up, you know, um, from the sign, they'll have the information on the sign. So I think signage is really a you know, critical part as well. I think it's really you know important part of this. And there are usually very beautiful signs to include. So just wanted to just share that with you. The other part on our website, since we're here, is our community science page. <clears throat> And community science is also a great way to engage um, residents and get involved you know, in improving the environment. So community science can range anywhere from iNaturalist, and then there's, we, um, there's so we broke it down to iNaturalist and then bird projects, and then also pollinator projects that people can be involved with. So hopefully you all know about eBird. This is a great way to keep track of the birds that you're seeing. Um, there's also um, urban birds, which is really a great program. This is observing birds in an urban setting. Um, just over a short period of time. Project Feeder Watch, Christmas Count. Nest Watch is a really good one right now. Um, this is something that we do in Doylestown Township. We actually have 32 different blue, um, nesting boxes right now. I have seven volunteers and 23 boxes being monitored. And all that information is then being sent to Cornell, which then helps them keep track of um, the populations of different um, you know, um, box nesting birds, such as um, tree swallows, um, chickadees, um, bluebirds, obviously. So it's a lot of fun. It's one of my favorite programs, actually. It's just so exciting to go in and see what's going on in a nest um, and then take that data and send it to Cornell and know that it's really making a difference. Um, so I just want to shoot down here then. There's also um, for um, other bird monitoring programs and then also butterfly monitoring programs, anywhere from Monarch, Monarch Watch um, to the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network e-butterfly and so on. <clears throat> I'm not gonna go through all these different programs because there's just so many, but um, we get the idea. This is um, a really great resource. I, you know, I'm really proud of that we put together on our website. So I hope you'll take a peek there. We also have a blog, um, it includes our, um, our newsletters and calendar, but it also has some really great articles. So I really hope that you'll take a peek at some of the articles that we have here. So let me see if I can get back to my presentation. Let's see if I can do that. Hmm. I did, yay. Okay, so let's continue on. So the, again, this was the backyard habitat recognition programs that I just mentioned. Um, this is the, all the, the full list here of all 10 of them. And 
Let's see, let me go to the next one. And then this is the community science programs that we just went through. So I hope you'll take you know, a moment to go back to the website and take a peek at those if, if you're not familiar with these programs. Um, also, what Bridgetown does is provide some you know, really important networking opportunities. And we have three ways of doing that. We had the Bridgetown Flyer. This is a bi-monthly e-newsletter for just the leaders. Um, we send this out to leaders and the municipal leaders to let them know what's going on with the program. Our um, next newsletter is coming out on Monday. And we're really excited to say that um, we just got our trademark through. So this is you know, something that we'll be sharing with our Birdtown leaders that um, our logo and name are actually trademarked now. And also sharing that we're gonna be working with Bird City Network as well, which I'll tell you a little bit more about later. Um, the second way we communicate is through Birdbead. This is a community e-newsletter that we share with residents. So anyone that signs up for a backyard habitat program, we encourage them to sign up for the newsletter so that we can provide that extra step of inspiration, encouragement, and guidance of what they can be doing, you know, on a, a quarterly basis, you know, per season, giving them some helpful tips, hopefully, for that. And then also we have finally the Birdtown Forum. This is a Facebook page. We have about 170 members. This is really for Birdtown leaders, again, for them to have a space where they can share some events that are coming up and also inspirational articles or things that they see that um, they think other Birdtown leaders would enjoy reading. So this is Bird Beat. Um, let's see, I think I actually have, a, I can actually go to it. This is one, our last one in spring. I just wanted to give you an idea what it looks like. And I really encourage you to sign up for it if you'd like to, to, to do so. Um, but this is um, for spring. So we had buzz pollination as, as just for bees. We had a really beautiful article about attracting hummingbirds. Um, we also always have a focus on one of the backyard habitat programs. Um, this is a, another focus on community science, the global big day that we all just celebrated last weekend. I know you guys just had the, the big festival for birds. So I, what a great timing for that, for this event as well. And then, you know, how to handle cats. So this just gives you an idea of what um, the, the newsletter looks like. So we're, you know, just giving information on native plants and birds, timely tips for your backyard and so on. This is a little form they can find on our website if you have interest um, to sign up for the newsletter if you would like to take a peek at it. So I want to give you some examples of bird towns in action. This is just like a little example of some of the things that we do. I'm going to break it down a little bit more carefully in the coming slides. But like over here, we have a tree giveaway. This is a big thing that um, a, a number of our bird towns do. Um, they also work th with their shade tree commissions to accomplish this, but it's a very exciting. Um, I'm really impressed with how many um, bird towns are doing this, of giving hundreds of trees away. And you know, we had a workshop just in January to share with other bird towns on um, how to do this. Um, there's just numerous um, ways to do that, but it's it's very inspiring. Um, then we also this is um we also do native plant sales, and this is actually my sale that I did last fall. And I thought it'd be really fun to have an explanation about the plants, and then also share with which birds would be attracted to this to this particular plant. So this is winterberry, one of my very favorites. It's just the, the blue, um, the red berries that come in January and February. They really attract a lot of robins, but in the, with, along with those flocks come a lot of cedar waxwings. And this is a picture, if you can tell, of a cedar waxwing, which is one of my favorite birds. Um, so we're so to really encourage our bird town leaders not to just focus on bird walks. We really want them to be doing um, acti activities and actions across many different ways, you know, many different ways of engaging in the community. So we encourage them to do municipal actions, such as working with a municipality, maybe to reduce pesticide use, um, a school district or working with children, community engagement, like those community science programs I just talked about, habitat enhancement, like reducing invasives, planting natives, and doing collaborations, you know, working with other organizations like watershed associations, Audubon chapters, and so on. Then advocacy, actually writing some articles or talking directly with their um, elected officials about if issues that they think are important for their community regarding birds and habitat um, and so on. So these are some examples. Um, this is Lansdowne Borough. They're um, down towards Philadelphia. And this is Christine pictured here, and she's very passionate and she does a lot of local library programming. Um, she, this past year, worked on focusing on migration, how to use binoc binoculars, and how to care for habitats. This is a program that she um, is doing right now called Steps into Nature. And every other Wednesday at 4 o'clock, she's meeting with a bunch of students and children and their parents, talking about any, anything from Earth Day to baby birds, their moms, and, and, and talking about how everyone is connected. So she's doing a great job working with children. Um, this is another example of that pop-up park 
Um, I hope you guys know what a park up, pop, pop up park is, but um, this is basically to keep all the plants in their pots and it's something that can just pop up in the middle of nowhere. So this one is actually in the front of a grocery store in um, our community. And you can bring trees and shrubs and plants and just create like a little place where you feel like you're in a forest or in a nice little, you know, um, na um, nature area. And um, Tom Price does this from New Britain Borough. It's a lot of fun. He gets a tent. They have music. They have dancing. They have speakers. Um, it's just a really fun event. It's a whole weekend. It's with this past one was September 16th, 17th, and 18th. So a whole weekend event. Um, so it's a really great way for people to come, actually see these plants, you know, up close and personal, see what they look like together, learn more about them. And it's just a really fun event. So I, I really highly, um, highly recommend pop-up parks. Um, we had one several years ago too, um, actually downtown. It was, we connected it with our county theater. So we put a pop-up park right in the middle of town. They closed off part of the um, highway for us. And um, we had a little park there right in front of the theater. And um, they showed a, like a, a, a nature film. I forget the name of the film, but it was really a fun event. So pop-up parks are really a lot of fun. So I also wanted to share with you about how we work with Audubon chapters. And I, these are three examples. We, there's many more, but these are the ones I wanted to share with you tonight. So this, um, we're gonna talk about Abington and Wincote Audubon Society, Newtown and Valley Forge Audubon, and then Wellsboro, which is way up in the Northeast corner of Pennsylvania and Tyadot and Audubon. So how Wincote Audubon Society works, they work with Abington. Abington is close to Philadelphia too. It's a very diverse community, but they're doing amazing things anywhere from habitat restoration with um, a, a wildlife sanctuary. They're doing plant removals and planting trees. They're also doing pop-up gardens and native plant sales. And then they're also doing tree giveaways and also um, bird walks. They also do, um, were part of the, of the greater Philadelphia Birdathon as well. Valley Forge Audubon Society, um, they were working with Newtown Township. This is um, right before COVID. Right before COVID, they passed a native plant resolution. And then they had all these things in place, which had to wait until things got better. But once things passed, um, they moved on. So they um, actually got a grant from Valley Forge Audubon Society, which provide, provide the township an opportunity to work with multiple partners. And all the partners are listed down here. Um, there's Willis, Willis Town Township, or I'm sorry, Willis Town Conservancy. Um, or, or trust um, the Audubon Society and also a number of nurseries. And they all work together to create a movable garden. So I think they started the township building, then they've moved the whole garden to the center of town. This is just a way to engage residents in different spaces of their community. And they really focus on, you know, really educating um, residents about the importance of planting native species. So they use some of the money to create these beautiful signs um, with information. And these signs moved along with the different um, garden now they're in place, actually, the plants were then taken back to the municipal building and actually planted, and these signs are then in place. So it was really good use of, of funding. And a great relationship and partnership with Valley Forge Audubon Society. They continue with that partnership. Um, they also were in their newsletter, and they also um, have become a huge advocate, actually, for our Birdtown program, which we really appreciate, and, and they've been so supportive. Um, we actually recently put a um, uh, workshop and webinar together to reach out to all the municipalities within their territory. And that was a lot of fun. We got, um, had some really good responses from that. They also donated $1,000 to the Birdtown program to create educational materials. So a huge thank you and shout out to Valley Forge Audubon Society. And then finally, my last one is um, Taya Dot and Audubon Society. So again, like I mentioned, they're way far up in the Northeast part of Pennsylvania. I was just there last week for the first time. I wanted to see what they were doing, you know, and it was super fun. So these are pictures from their visitor bureau. Their visitors bureau is super supportive of Birdtown and of their Audubon Society. They do a lot of work with them. Done, um, and so there apparently there was um, a terrible um, bird strike against the door. Um, the um, head of the visitors bureau came into work one day and saw a bunch of dead birds, and she was so upset. So they worked together to. Um, you know, figure out how to deal with this and, and address this. Then they contacted Peter Sanger in Muhlenberg, um, who's also on the PA Audubon, um, so PA Audubon Society um, Council, is also the president of Lehigh Valley Audubon Society. And so he gave them some, some guidance. They helped create this wonderful brochure that they could provide for the residents. And they created, um, actually got Kaleidoscape. So on the right side here is what it looks like on the outside. 
And then if you go on the inside looking through, you can't even tell that it's there. So it's really remarkable, um, these materials that have been created to help you know, create safer spaces for birds. Um, and um, so that, I think that's really interesting. And there was a realization that I had um, talking with some folks recently, I think it was actually with Peter, is that we you know, have done so much work of you know, educating, encouraging people to plant native plants around their homes. But we're welcoming these birds into an unsafe space when you think about it. We have all these windows from our homes and we're welcoming them in with these native plants. It's not safe. So if we're gonna be planting native plants, then we really, really have to address our windows as well. So this is just one great example of how to do that is you know, looking at Kaleidoscape or um, Feather Friendly. These are great programs of how to address windows um, as we welcome birds into our, our, our habitats and spaces around our homes. So a great program. So finally, I just want to share with you a little bit about the program itself. And just in case there's a municipality that you're, you're in, you think they would like to be a bird town out in your area. It's a four tiered program. Um, all bird towns start at the green level. And then you can work up to the different levels of bronze, silver, and gold as you want. There's no um, time limit or we understand that there's, you know, there's only so many volunteers, there's only so much financial support to, to accomplish these things. So everyone works at their own pace. And we're there the whole step of the way to help you and encourage you and um, give you ideas. The process isn't difficult. There's a um, municipal application toolkit. Um, it's basically just an application. It gives you um, a sample resolution, which we encourage to be passed so that municipal leaders are supporting the Birdtown program and supporting whoever um, creates the program and also create a Birdtown committee. We found that if there's just one person reading, um, running the program, if that person leaves and the whole program can um, crumble. So we've just found with our new bird towns, um, having a committee of two, three, four people really gives a strong foundation for the program. And then finally, just completing the application, letting us know what you've accomplished so far and what your plans are for the future. And then we work with you that first year really to try to encourage you to get to the bronze level if that's possible. So it's not a difficult application process. We want it to be an easy lift to become a bird town because we just feel like it's on. Um, the more people we can engage and educate and communicate about um, the actions that they can be taking to support birds and wildlife, the better. And that's everything that I wanted to share with you tonight. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'd love to hear if you have any questions. I would encourage everybody to um, unmute themselves and show their video and we could talk with Heidi. That'd be great. Yeah, let me get rid of this here. Well, I'll start out with a question, Heidi. Okay. Um, success for smaller municipalities versus larger municipalities. What, what, how, how does that seem to, to, um, to shake out? You know, that's a really good question. And I find actually that my smaller municipalities tend to be more successful because Boroughs tend to be, everyone seems to be engaged. I mean, the boroughs that I work are, a lot of the residents are all engaged. They're really passionate about their their um, little, their little town or community. So actually I find Mary that the smaller the borough, the more successful. So the one that I was showing you with the pop-up garden, you know, that whole event that was a weekend long, that's a tiny little borough. And so the whole borough comes together, all the residents come together to support that program. There's another one, Morrisville borough. Um, they're near the city in Philadelphia. And that's another really passionate bro. There's a lot of people that come and support the programs. Also Jenkintown, Jenkintown's another little small borough. Um, they're very much engaged. And then Swarthmore, Swarthmore Borough just became a bird town and they're so engaged. Um, they have an amazing committee um, for bird town. They actually have the vice president of Philadelphia Horticultural Society on their committee. So, it, so yeah, I don't think it matters how big or small you are to, of how successful that you can be as a bird town. And we've also been working with um, Boroughs and townships that are close together, they can actually come together as one. You know, if it's if, if it's too much of a lift for one municipality, they can come together um, um, as one. And we're also seeing that um, we're having really encouraging bird towns to work together. We're calling it bird town clusters. So in my community, we call it the Central Bucks Bird Town Cluster. So it includes Doylestown Township, Doylestown Borough, New Britain Borough, Shalfon Borough, and Solbury Township. And we all come together. We, we um, recently came together to do the Greater Philadelphia Birdathon. We did a big sit where we sat for four hours and um, counted birds. We had the best time. So it was just so much fun to work with these other bird town leaders and do some brainstorming and 
think of ways that we can um, work together to support our program, you know, our program some more and do really amazing conservation actions in our, our communities. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was assuming that smaller communities probably have greater success. Um, and I'm, I, because I look at Erie and see the, the pitfalls of being a larger community and how dif difficult it is sometimes to engage with um, the, the respective um, councils and, and, and whatnot. And I'm wondering if there's any kind of suggestion for larger municipalities. Um, I do. I, I do actually have some. So, I mean, most, you know, larger cities have, I mean, we work with a number of big cities. We have um, um, Bethlehem City, we have Allentown, you know, we're working with a number of, of uh, communities right around Philadelphia area as well. So I think working with neighborhoods, really engaging different neighborhoods is the way to go. You know, cities are comprised of neighborhoods, so really getting into the different neighborhoods. Every neighborhood has its own flavor. So really engaging with each neighborhood. There's always, you know, within each neighborhood, there's always some leaders there, you know, be it a church group or, you know, a church um, organization to work with or um, some kind of um, watershed associations I'm finding are, you know, very much involved with their, you know, neighborhoods within cities. So I think that's the way to go. It's again, small, like you're saying, Mary, but they, they do exist within cities, you know, really engaging with the neighborhood. Yeah. It's just probably uh, uh, more moving parts. Um, but, yeah, certainly it is. I mean, but I think, you know, it, to be like, for example, Erie, you know, maybe not the whole city would be engaged, but maybe it would be like three or four or more neighborhoods that would be engaged. And that, wow, what, wouldn't that be amazing? Mm -hmm. So that, that would be my suggestion as neighborhoods. Okay. Well, Erie just, just started their environmental advisory council, the city council officially appointed three of the seven. I'm one of the three. Yes, <laughs> and Congratulations. That's exciting. What? Well done. That's an amazing accomplishment. Oh, it's taken quite a bit of effort. And I'm the only one so far on there who is part of the group that put the project together with Penn Futures help. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think, you know, that at least might be a vehicle within the city to do such. The mayor seems to love to be part of things, you know, the welcoming city, the this city, the that city. Um, it depends how much cachet this designation has, whether he would be attracted to it or not. Um, I understand that we have we have um, I'm working with um, Allentown and Allentown is the same way his the mayor is very enthusiastic about Birdtown we have beautiful street signs that you would get for free when you become a Birdtown and so we're working with him right now to create a proclamation about Birdtown we're going to have a um, ribbon cutting where we present a certificate and the street signs he's so excited about it so and we're working with their EAC in Allentown we also work with the EAC in Bethlehem City. So I, I understand that, you know, it, there is a bit of a wow factor with that. With Bethlehem City, I, I was um, coming, this was a surprise to me. I was delivering to them, to their municipal leaders and their Birdtown leaders in Bethlehem City. And the press showed up. I was actually on TV. I was so unexpected. <laughs> I wasn't planning to have to give a presentation on TV. But it, I mean, this is, you know, when you're working with a city, that's what you had to expect. So I was actually on the you know, the evening news about Birdtown. And that was exciting. You know, it was exciting for the program, it was exciting for the city. Um, interesting about Bethlehem City is that um, they had chimney swifts. There was gonna be a, a de demolition of a building and one of the chimneys had um, chimney swifts and actually the, um, the, the person who bought the property decided to save the chimney and the chimney swift has now become the bird of Bethlehem City. And they've um, engaged with an artist. There's beautiful murals of um, chimney swifts all over the city now. And it's the official bird of the city. So, that, you know, that's something to think about for Erie. You know, is there a bird that would, you know, get a lot of attention or have a special meaning to Erie? You know, you guys have all that migration coming through there. Maybe there's a special bird that would, you know, spark interest for everybody. What's his name, Mary, that we had speak? Um... Scott Burnett. Is that the one you're thinking of? Because he told us this story, Heidi, about a building that was supposed to be knocked down and they talked to the owner and then they left the chimney. And uh, yeah, yeah, we're, 
we're trying here in Erie to get um, part of a factory that's being torn down to have some of the chimneys left behind for the oh. chimney swifts. Uh, and we were promised that was going to happen, but I, have, I haven't followed through on it, and I'm not sure what stage they are in a dem demolishing that building. Um, they're, so they're, they're, they're actually saving one portion of it, but they're not probably going to save the chimneys, but that we wanted to put um, artificial chimney swift towers on top of the remaining building to replace the ones that the chimney swifts are losing. Um, but it's it's in the process of, of being demolished. Wow. So they're not even close. Um, they're getting closer physically to the building that's being saved. Um, so, but that, that building still stands and I don't know if they've done anything with the, the chimneys on top of it. I know the Swifts are back um, mm -hmm. this season. And actually it was on my mind to, to talk to you about that, Sue. Okay, all right. Yeah, it'd be yeah. great for them not to demolish it until the birds are gone again. I mean, they're there right now nesting, so it'd be nice to wait. Well, yes, and but I don't think, I, I don't know exactly what their plans are for the chimneys on that building, mm -hmm. but they've already demolished probably some of them that had been used, oh. but we can't really put up artificial ones until they're done because it's, you know, a construction right. site. No, of course. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, chimney swifts have come up in my community too. They were looking to demolish a school, a local school, and one of our local birders realized that there was chimney swifts within the chimney and actually helped save the, the school. So they end up saving the school. And um, no one even knew that the, there were chimney swifts there. So we're actually going to be doing, um, looking to do an educational program for the school now that it's staying in place. And, you know, looking to put a mural in and doing programming in the school. So yay, chimney swifts, you know, they're a, a great way to get attention in, you know, moral and more um, urban settings. So yeah, yeah, they're, they're definitely um, an urban bird that needs help. And, right. and, you know, I, I think once people, I the the gal that we talked to, who was the is the um, executive director of the Erie County Development, um, what corporation or whatever they are, um, she she's she seemed open to you know being a good steward and and making sure that you know that that some kind of habitat for chimney swifts um, is 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 put in place or left in place so that's great that's wonderful what a great story i hope it ends happily we yeah, think yeah <laughs> that's great uh carolyn had mentioned about um uh, Master Gardeners. Actually, Carolyn, from what I understand, Master Gardeners and Freda, you might know, they are actually working on uh, with local nurseries to get them to provide more native plants. Does that ring a bell, Freda? Well, I, actually, I don't, I don't know about that specifically, but I was listening to the Backyard Ecology podcast, and they had someone from Mount Cuba on, and he was specifically talking about their Carrick study, but he was talking about how they are trying to identify native plants and some native ours that have the best ecological services. That's the phrase some people are using. Mm -hmm. I was a little nervous about the way he said they want to drive the public and the landscape industry towards these specific native plants and, and some cultivars. I mean, he, but he, what he's trying to do there, what Mount Cuba is trying to do is get the nurseries to on board to carry some of these things they're not carrying now. I was just a little spooked when he said driving them towards these because are they cloning them or, you know, do we, do we want to have too many of the same people growing, growing the same stuff, but I mean, I think this bird town is really interesting. But there are so many project programs going on, and I know there's there's the what the the master gardeners are doing, but there's also the watershed stewards and what they're doing. Sure. Um, yeah, we know there's something in the chat from Pamela about this. Maybe Pamela, you'd want to turn your audio and video on and explain what you put in the chat because I'll bet you people would have questions for you if you're comfortable doing that. Oh, I don't actually have a camera tonight, but 
Um, there is a project with Amber Stillwell and the Sea Grant people, and including us as master gardeners and the watershed people. And we are we they developed a survey and we surveyed all of the nurseries in the area, really a, a lot toward the state, asking them what what do people buy and what natives do they carry and do people buy them and then the uh the idea is we're hoping to develop a resource so we could show nurseries and people if you want a native plant to replace this popular plant this is what you might buy and encourage the nurseries to stock them that's great, that's great. yeah that's really great news and i also i just want to jump into it are they also talking about noxious plants that they can take off like they really shouldn't be selling like burning bush or you know those kind of um, really invasive um, species that are you often find at, at nurseries so hopefully are you guys addressing that as well possibly at, in this study not but as master gardeners if we we informally if we see people saying oh i want to get a burning bush we advise them uh, what else they could try Okay, good. Yeah, I just it would be great to talk to the landscapers too, to not even sell it. You know, that's you know the next step. I know that um burning bush has been put on the noxious weed list for Pennsylvania. They're not supposed to be able to even sell it. So I think okay. that's next year, isn't it? Is it the next year? Okay. Well, this year is Japanese barberry. I'm not. Yay! Sure. That's a good one. Yay! I'm so glad that one's been listed. <laughs> that's great news. Well, yeah. it, it sounds to me like we have a lot of good groups doing a lot of good work. Um, maybe it's time for a larger collaboration between all those individual groups. Um, Freda, I was going to mention to you, you probably already know, but uh, neighborhood organizations like our West Bayfront and the Academy neighborhood would be great groups to reach out to as part of the council, um, Environmental Advisory Council, um, to for projects because they're already organized and do, um, you know, uh, events and, and acti have activities open to the public. So that would be a great conduit for learning and, and getting things out. Um, and of course, supposedly, hmm? supposedly our, our West Bayfront is going to have some kind of greenhouse and grow native plants. Oh, well, nice. I don't know why you need to grow native plants in a greenhouse, but anyway that's what i heard um, well my guess is is that you know if you if they're if they're trying to to start native plants from seed they need some place to keep them going before they're big enough to to give away right so yeah. we, i just want to mention something that gene ganger and i are involved with on the 23rd i think that's tuesday we are meeting along with Greg Kadzierski from Earn Seed with the um, the the director and the maintenance director of the Erie Water Authority at one of their 10 acre properties to talk about doing a demonstration lawn conversion project. Yay, that's great. And and Sarah Peelman has some funding to do something like that with some boulevard. That's fantastic. That's wonderful. I mean, really what Birdtown does is, you know, not so much trying to step on anyone's toes, it's really trying to pull, you know, folks together to work together and also just provide resources, you know, it provides a network. What I think is the beauty of the program is the sharing that goes on between the Birdtown leaders. When we have meetings, you know, people share some projects that they're doing. So it just inspires folks of what they can be doing and, and gives them um, the foundation and the framework of how to do that. So I think that's the beauty of the program too, which is that that resource and that networking that goes on between the, the Birdtown leaders. So does Birdtown PA have any paid staff? I suspect no. No. <laughs> no, they're all volunteers. Who coordinates the volunteers? Yourself. Um, each of the bird towns do. I mean, we have a board of um, seven people on our board. You know, we basically do the running of the overall operational part of the organization. And um, but each each bird town is their own entity. They work directly with their municipality. But like I was mentioning, some of these bird towns we're really encouraging more regionalization, um, work networking together, so that the bird towns can come together and share resources and ideas and help you know support each other, um, and also support events. Um, but it really, each bird town is their own entity, and they can be, you know, as involved or not as they want to be. You know, we, obviously, we're encouraging them to do as much as they can possibly do 
Um, and we'd provide the support, you know, as we can. We're looking to, we just got a $10,000 grant, or not grant, actually money, a donation. Um, our local bank, Penn Community Bank, loves the work that we're doing. They just gave us $10,000. So we're going to be using that money to create many grants. Um, so our, we're putting an application process together where our bird towns can apply for um, up between $500 to $1,000 for a project. And um, we'll look at the applications and then give the many grants. So that's, you know, that's our hope. But we're also creating a lot of educational material and brochures um, to provide, you know, materials for tabling events and so on for our bird towns. So that's the advantage of being part of the program. Mm -hmm. You've accomplished a lot. It's really... <sighs> Well, it's, it's a lot of fun and I love all the people I'm working with. It's so wonderful to work with so many passionate people, so many knowledgeable people. I've learned so much. It's really exciting. It's, you know, such a positive thing to be doing in hard times. I mean, we all we hear about is, you know, so many terrible things that are happening with climate change and so on. And it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to do good, you know, and to make a difference. And you can really see a difference. I mean, in my own yard, you know, I have 10 acres and I've planted probably I don't know, hundreds of native plants and trees. And I can see such a difference that it can make within one season. You see more birds, you see more different butterflies, and it really does make a difference. So, and that's that's wonderful. You know, how often do we have a chance to make a difference, you know, and it, it, it's exciting to have that opportunity. And I, I'm excited that I can share it across, you know, with so many other people to spread the goodness, you know, across our beautiful state of Pennsylvania. You, you were talking about the different signage and why signage is important. And I, I would love to see on every sign from every program, a QR code. Sure. So people could look it up instantly. Um, yeah. And um, that would be a great addition to the signage because people can see a sign and maybe be interested. Mm -hmm. But by the time they get home, they've forgotten what the name is. No, you're because. right. That's, I completely agree with that. That's a really good point, Mary. That's you know something I can recommend to these programs, but I, I couldn't agree more. I think a QR code is the way to go, yeah. for sure. I want to share too with you about the on the Bird Town sign. Actually, um, I, I'm working with Wissahickon Trails. It's a watershed association um, in Philadelphia, and um, Tom Voter is the fellow I'm working with to bring Ambler Borough on as a Bird Town. So we were doing a presentation together. And he said um, he came up to one of his slides and it had our Bird Town sign on. He said, "I pass this sign every day." You know, as a young boy, it, it inspired him to become a birder and then inspired him eventually to become an ecologist and work with the Watershed Association. But I was so touched that our bird town sign impacted him in that way that, you know, he passed it every day and it made him think, you know, what he could be doing to do better. And so I just thought that was so powerful, you know, that, that a sign can make that much of a difference. So, sure. hmm. and he's a young man, he's in his 20s. It was just, it really just, you know, was just, just so amazing. So I've actually taken his little quote and I use it for a number of my presentations now to share with people because it's, it's really cool, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you know I, and I think that like what, what you said about signage is important because, you know, like we, we have a quote unquote weedy lawn. Um, but if we had a, a sign out front, um, and, and our backyard is Audubon certified with their old certification, something mm -hmm. or other. Um, and um, if we had a sign out front that explained why we have a weedy lawn, um, then the neighbor who, who gets lawn chemical treatment would, you know, see it and understand why we have a weedy lawn. <laughs> I know, I know, you know, we, we our, our next door neighbor, she's a lovely woman. But she's afraid of anything outside of her home. Um, she has the whole house sprayed for spiders. Oh. Um, I, I, I'm telling you, I I'm telling you, she has lawn lawn care. You know the weeds, the bugs. She she cut down she cut down the big conifer in her backyard because mm -hmm. there were too many ants. Oh, that's tragic. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't convince her otherwise. And actually, after she cut down the tree, there were more ants because they had nowhere to go. Uh, but I think that's the, the nice thing too. Bird Town, um, just to say, most people really love birds. I mean, I, I think it's a really good access point for a lot of people. It's non-political. You know, every, everyone I, you know, anywhere I go, people always have a story for me about a bird. You know, so I think that's, you know, a really good access point to start a conversation with people is about birds. You, know, you probably see that as an Audubon society. You know, people, you're, you're the bird people. So, you know, people, that's a really great way to bring people on. So like your neighbor, 
Hopefully she likes birds like a hummingbird, you know, or a bluebird. You know, those kind of birds are just an easy way to start a conversation with someone. And then you can slowly, you know, mention about pesticides and how they need those 6,000 caterpillars to feed one little nest of birds. And that's just we, a great we, we've way. We've tried. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we've we tried. <laughs> I have the same problem. I have been surrounded by neighbors too that use pesticides and I've given them books and articles and I just keep on trying. Right. So, yeah. Well, I figure if we, we lead by example, we, I don't want to hit her over the head, you know? Yeah. I and um, she loves our backyard. She thinks it's beautiful, but you know, I understand. Yeah. I saw some, somebody next door or two houses down the the true green people were spraying the walls and the mm. outside walls and I thought uh yeah spiders whatever it's it, it's it's really tragic it is I've been watching um videos from Heather Holm and some of those people I mean that's really fascinating about the ground nesting bees and the bees that build chambers of nests within um the stems it's yes just so fascinating and yeah I, th I just think the more people who know about that it would be great no ground nesting bees are so interesting our native pollinators are so effective and efficient so much more than our honeybees which are not native and i mean i was a beekeeper for five years and i quit being a beekeeper because one other beekeepers are not doing their job of protecting their bees and then two, all the diseases that my um, that the honeybees have go into the native populations, which weaken them. And then, then the kicker is, is that our native bee populations are far more efficient than the honeybees. So we really should be doing all we can to support them. And the best way to do that is plant native plants. So just saying, that's, you know, you know, so, you know, native bees are really important. And it is interesting. I agree that they're, most of them are ground nesters. Heidi, do you have any idea how many people get your Bird Town um, or your Bird Beat newsletter? Because I encourage Prescott Audubon members to sign up. It's so engaging to read and useful. But I'm just wondering if you knew how many. We have a thousand right now. I'm getting it. Um, we also have a, a meetup group through um, Allentown and Bethlehem. That, and so we're trying to access them too. That would be another 2,000. So we're still working on that part. So we're hoping to bring it up to 3,000 by the next edition. That should go out on June 15th. Okay. So we're already working on the writing. Uh, I have a really great team that does the writing. We have um, Barbara Malt, who's from Lehigh Valley Audubon. She's um, a professor at Lehigh. She writes for it. We have another lady, Karen Campbell. She's an expert about bees and pollinators. Christine is our editor. She's, you know, I mentioned her about what she's doing in Lansdale with kids. So she does the kids section, which is, I think, really important to engage children, you know, about nature. I jump in there because they need some folks to write as well. So, um, so we spend months, you know, writing the, the newsletter. We spend a lot of time on it. And, you know, it's a, a work of love and joy. And hopefully that's getting imparted. I think it's very good. So you. your website is all done by volunteers. Yes. Oh. Yeah, we work hard seven days a week. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do it because I love it. I mean, you know, I'm really passionate and I really enjoy the work. So I don't mind it. You know, it's an hour here, five hours there. You know, it's not grueling by any means. It's a lot of fun. So. I'm, I'm just honored to have the opportunity to do the work, honestly. Well, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you do an amazing job up there in Erie. You guys are doing a great job up there. I love hearing about the work you're doing. And, you know, thank you for all that you're doing. I'm so excited that you have an EAC now. That's such a huge job. And it is. Yeah, yeah. that's a big deal for the city. Yes, so. it is. Yeah. And I want to thank you guys for having me tonight. It was such an honor to be here and talking with you. Thank you for spending time with me on a Friday night and talking about these really important things. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I know my, my Gmail is pabirdtown at gmail.com. I'm always happy to hear any suggestions or ideas or if you think your neighborhood or community would have interest in doing Birdtown, if we can help in any way, let me know. Any questions? And oh, here's something in the chat. Oh, here's a thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, Pamela. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, let me uh, ask a question. Um, I'm trying to characterize our area. There's a lot of rural areas and um, uh, farmers and hunters, and we have supervisors who are full time and 
you know, they'll spend a lot of time out on the roads, digging trenches, et cetera. How do you approach them with the concept of now introducing something like per bird town? Well, that's a that's a challenge, honestly. I think those municipalities are challenging. You know, if you have a an area that's very rural, um, you know, there is a lot of native plants and trees in place already. It may not make sense to do that. I mean, you really need, you know, to be successful in an area like that, you need a you know a supervisor or a parks and rec person that's really passionate about birds and understands the importance of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, it, it doesn't fit for every you know organ for every municipality or township, but there has to be an interest. And I honestly don't want to go into a municipality or township that 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 um doesn't have interest. It really, it really makes a difference to have a program that's going to be successful if you have a person that's passionate about what's what we're talking about. Otherwise, it's too big of a lift sometimes. So it's just too big of a span to try to bridge. So really, you need a couple people in the community that are really passionate about, about birds, about native plants, and doing this kind of work. Because I don't, you know, I, I have a couple bird towns that are struggling, and it's really challenging. I'd rather work with a group that's really passionate and wants to see this be successful. Um, you know, sometimes it's just too hard to bridge sometimes. It takes time. Maybe it's not the right time right now. I you know some of my bird towns that are struggling. I'm just waiting and waiting for the leadership to change. The, you know, I had um one township. Um, I so I went to Springfield Township in Bucks County. It was a pouring rain night. It was horrible weather, and they were shocked that I made it there. So you know, the township manager was so impressed that I came. Well, he changed jobs. He moved to another township, and they had the township contact me to become a bird town. So I get into the meeting. He's like, "Do you remember me?" I was there the night that the rainy night. I was so impressed with what you were doing and your passion that I've been convinced my township to become a bird town. So, I mean, you know, that's when it makes a difference. You want someone that's passionate and understands, you know, the work that we're doing that all of us are doing here on, on tonight and um, want to support it and want other residents to be engaged in doing it as too, as well. So I, I hope that answers your question. Well, I, 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 it led to another question for me, which, which is if Erie decides to do this, should we do it? at the city level or the county level? Is the county too big? I think so. I think a city would be a better way to go for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I had a, a sort of a related question. Yesterday was um, Native Species Day. Yes, it was. And, uh, right, and the Invasive Species Council had a event at the North Creek Nursery and PennDOT, everybody gave their little spiel and PennDOT talked about the things they're trying to do with other people. But what I see is, and I wondered if if you have any similar experience, they're clear cutting adjacent to our inner, like we have a neighborhood, my neighborhood at the bottom of one of the streets, it's adjacent to I-79 and they've totally removed all the vegetation that was there and they're doing it all up and down and I don't, understand i wondered if you have any understanding of what they're doing because they seem oh. to think it's a good idea yeah that, that i can't speak to i don't know exactly what they're doing i mean within my township we have 66 miles of road and they were spraying all of it oh. so i did i know i did a campaign about pesticides and how terrible they are so they're no longer spraying which is a wonderful thing they're also not mowing as much i mean we spend a hundred thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars on mowing every year in my little township I can't imagine, you know, the money that's spent. So, I mean, you know, to that question, you probably have to contact PennDOT or con, you know, um, contact someone in the city that works with PennDOT um, they, on their transportation and so on and see what they're doing. I, I don't know specifically, but, you know, it might take a couple of calls to figure out and what's going on there. But I've had the neighbors complained to them and they were not responded to. Yeah, that's frustrating. Well, I, I would have more than one person call. If several people call, they'll have to pay attention. Hmm. So. Carolyn had a question, and I suppose this could um, be given to anybody in the group to answer. Are garden clubs open to native plants instead of exotics? I don't know. Does anybody have an experience with garden clubs? I do. I mean, Doylestown Nature Club, um, they're open to it. But it, 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 it's because the people that are that make up the group, there are, a lot of them are master um, master gardeners, so they're they're you know knowledgeable. Where there's other some other garden clubs that are not, you know, open to native club, you know, native plants. So it just depends, you know, what the focus is of the native, the focus of the garden club. You know, sometimes they're competitive and they want to grow the prettiest flower, and you know, it just depends on the garden club. Yeah, I, and I was going to say, from my experience with um, garden clubs, um, just from the periphery, I'm not a member of any of them. Um, I, I think that a lot of members in in various groups. 
like the idea of native plants, but it comes to a screeching halt when their favorite plant, they find out that their favorite plant or the, the pretty ones are non-native and, and they, they shouldn't use them. And they're like, oh, but I love my butterfly bush. <laughs> no, I know. So I, I get that. And I, what I try to do is, you know, just say, you don't have to rip out all your plants in your yard. Obviously, that would be way too expensive. Mm -hmm. So I think tuck, tucking in native plants wherever you can, you know, right. you know tuck it in. You know, right. and you know, slowly deal with the butterfly bush. I find the butterfly bush is such a lo beloved plant. You know, but just explain to it how it jumps the fence and how it's, you know, it's really, you know, problematic. But if they really are just so attached to the butterfly bush, they can keep it. But if they can add, 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 add native plants as much as they can, yeah. you know, that's great. Yeah, I, my yard is not totally native. Mine is, Mine is you know, native. And actually, I have a butterfly bush. That's and the, the reason I have a butterfly bush is because some friends of mine gave it to me oh. when my mother died. Oh, that's special. That's a special plant. So I can't really kill no. it. You know, <laughs> yeah. You can leave it in place. I mean, I just think it's important to add, yeah, add to our, you know, our environment, add to our I, I have lots of everything else going on. I've got winterberry, I've got clethra, I've got um all all kinds of native ground covers. Um mm -hmm. all my perennials are mostly natives, you know. So you're, you're doing great. I think yeah. that's perfect. You know, so I think and I, I'm doing the same thing. I'm not everything in my yard is native by any means. I couldn't afford it. I mean, I went, I was went to buy plants um, this, this last couple of weeks. My gosh, everything costs a fortune right now. It's like three times more, you know, cost wise this year than it was last year. Yeah. So I had to cut back on what I was going to be planting this year because like, everything's so expensive. So mm -hmm. definitely keep the plant material you have in your gardens, but just add, you know, add, add, add. Right. Add native plants where you can and where it makes sense. And if something dies, then you can sneak a native plant in there. But right. um, I mean, that's what I would encourage people to do. Yeah. But yeah. And, and as somebody pointed out, natives are beautiful. Um, and finding the natives is the biggest obstacle, sure. um, which is true. But that's you have to look for native plant sales. I, and they're growing. I, I'm starting to see more interest in native plant sales in this area. Good. That's um, really wonderful. And I think also seed banks are really critical. I was, um, where was I? I was in Allentown. Allentown has a seed bank. So they create, because it's, you know, these are really expensive. So for folks that can't afford, you know, plant material, they provide seed packets. They create like, you know, they collect all these seeds. So that might be something to, to think about, you know, as master gardeners is, you know, creating seed banks of collecting mm -hmm. those seeds in the fall and creating, starting creating seed banks that then you can distribute across the communities the following year. So you know, it's just maybe a goal to think about. Yeah, and I, but I also think that we have to change people's ideas about what is beautiful. Oh, of course. And <laughs> and that's that's a huge aesthetic thing, mm -hmm. um, and that's going to take time. That's only a matter, you know, of of changing the way people think about um, a flower being beautiful. Yeah, I, I wouldn't focus on the beauty of it though. It's just the the um. The um, what it, ecological service that it provides, you know, like we mentioned, it's six thousand to nine thousand caterpillars. I mean, people love butterflies and moss; those are something of beauty. We love our birds, we love our ecosystem. So mm -hmm. to support that whole thing, that's also something of beauty too that we want to support. So oh, absolutely. But you know, sometimes know. It, it takes a while to get there. For it people. does. It definitely takes time. Uh, but I, Heidi, I think your idea of starting to approach people by focusing on birds makes a lot of sense because nobody is anti-bird unless they don't like a pigeon or something, you know, but everybody right. only likes birds. And, and like I, I've met anti-bird people. Yeah, but most people don't. And most people like birds. I know, but. Yeah, there's there, there, there are some. I mean, I've had, I had someone call me. They were really angry that there was a, a woodpecker, you know, banging on their, their barn. They were so angry with this bird. And, you know, <laughs> Or, or the cardinal at their window, like, you know, come over, I'm about to shoot this bird. I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> you know, no, they certainly can, you know, cause some frustration, but the, but in general, I think people enjoy a bird. So like, it's like, it's, so they don't like the, the cardinal or the, the woodpecker. They certainly like a hummingbird. I mean, who doesn't love a hummingbird? I mean, they're amazing. I would love to see, um, since if it's, we're talking something bird centric, some kind of an event to make it easy for people to do the bird friendly window thing. Because, you know, some kind of group purchasing or a demonstration, an opportunity yeah. to watch somebody yeah. install them or whatever. Because I haven't done mine yet. Um, 
it seems to be only a problem for me with my front window when the service barriers are out. But um, I just think if there was, you know, if, if I could get the stuff jointly with other people and see how to do it, it'd be better than just reading about it. Well, yeah, make sure you come to our June 2nd member program or program and picnic because we have door prizes and one of them is feather friendly dots for your window. And the other one is the um, paracord and uh, clear duct tape to hold it in place. So if you win that, you can get a couple windows done. But I know it, it is pricey, they are pricey, yeah. But I think, you know, you write about demonstration. I think, you know, like we've been talking about this within our community, it's uh, having a demonstration at, at the local post office. At our local post office a couple years ago, I was there and um, a flock of cedar wax wings hit the window. It was just devastating. Oh. But I, I think, you know, it's important to, to impart that story and then show us a display, you know, have a, you know, a demonstration and have the display at the post office with the story. But I think you're completely right. Demonstrations are really critical, you know, to show people how to do this so they don't feel intimidated by it. You know, Absolutely. You know, and I want to backtrack. The feather, the dots are expensive. The paracord is cheap as can be. I think we did our whole house for, and we have many windows. I'm going to say like 30 bucks. We have, wow. It's cheap. Paracord and we got Gorilla outdoor tape that matches our window frame colors. And it's just, you just cut it and hang it, tape it up. And it's been up for three years. And it's- Wow, see, that's amazing. See, I mean, that, that would be a great, have you written a story about it? Like an article about that and showing some photos of your house? Yeah, I, had, I had my husband build a display and we we um, have it up at various Audubon events. So one window has the dots on it. One window has the paracord. And then we have a poster in between them and explains why you'd want to do something like this. And I love the poster because it also has a cat looking out the window at <laughs> earlier, and at the bottom of the poster, it says, keep your cats indoors. So we that's cover awesome. two strikes and cats in one poster. Oh, um, see, that's great. I love that. That's fantastic. I think okay. that's exactly what, you know, should be done. Great idea. But the post office, that's great because it's centrally located. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Or a library, you know, a library or post office where people yeah. are coming. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I forgot about this. Uh, we have that Tom Ridge Environmental Center here in Erie. It's the welcoming to Prescott State Park. And uh, DCNR is putting up feather-friendly dots on many of the big windows around the cafe. And we, Prescott Audubon, paid for them. So hopefully we'll get some coverage for that too. They're going to install them, um, I think, the, towards the end of this month or early in June. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. They, 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 you were looking for volunteers for that, right? Well, actually, Heidi uh, or Holly Best was. I'm, I don't oh, have. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I, <laughs> and I think she got enough uh, people to help out with that. Okay. But I mean, there's thousands of people that go to the Tom Ridge Center. And so they're going to have that right there. And I think that'll be a great advertisement. Oh, Pam, 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 Pamela says that they're installing them next Wednesday. Oh, cool. And mm -hmm. Pamela's obviously on board to help. Yeah. <laughs> Sure, hey, would be nice. sure it would be nice if we could get Erie Insurance or the new prep school building or Marquette or one of those big window places. Um, well, you know, Erie Bird Observatory has started the Bird Safe Erie program. Okay. Um, and, and, and part of that is collecting data. Um, they visit they visit various buildings um, every morning during migration. And um, that the 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 first thing we need to do is collect data, so that we can show people. You know, we 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 found these many dead birds outside your building, um, and that is you know, and, and getting people on board is is really important for lights out and, but it has to be the building owners. It has to be the building managers. Um, uh, in other big cities, there's a building owner and building managers associations. Um, Erie doesn't have a building owner and building managers association. So that's, you know, it, it, it'll it take less time because you'll, or more time because you have to go to individual businesses um, and talk about that. I really do think that Erie Insurance will be on board at some point because they have enough presence in their town. Um, and if we show them that their buildings are killing a lot of birds, um, they're they're gonna be worried about their image. And and they also have an environmental um, one of their their giving focuses is environmental. So 
if, if and in Erie, um, Erie Bird Observatory is already like, you know, we've already gotten money from them. So we're in touch with them. So mm -hmm. I think we can, we can make that happen eventually. It good. takes time. It takes, it takes time and it takes money. Yeah. Um, and, um, in data. To we couldn't get people. them to put native plants in those new big planters there installed. They didn't <laughs> we're, want we're doing what we can. <laughs> no, I mean, I well, we had people talking to people and, and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. I We have a, a bunch of places kind of in my neighborhood where people have these massive barberry hedges. Oh. Have Have people been able to have any luck getting people to substitute things for the barberries? I mean, I think it's hit or miss. I mean, we put a brochure together called Let's Limit Limes. And there was research done by um, Dr. Dan Duran. What a, what a name, right? But I heard a presentation. Um, so um, barberry and um, lanisaria um, type, you know, the invasive honeysuckle as well as burning bush, they actually change the chemistry of the soil. And the change of the soil attracts white-footed mice and then ticks. So I think letting homeowners know that part is, you know, a bit of an incentive for them to get rid of those kind of those three specific invasives. So burning bush, um, barberry, and then the invasive honeysuckle. I can send you the brochure, Sue, so you have it. But I'm mean, giving that kind of information, that kind of education to homeowners is a little bit of a, a gentle push. Like you really don't want this in your yard. You really don't want to be encouraging ticks in your yard, right? With those those three specific plants, which I think is just so interesting, right? Yeah. Where, where is that information available? Um, I, I can send it to you. It's a, a brochure I actually made um, working with Dan Duran, Dr. Dan Duran, um, with another of my um, EAC members. But I, I can send it to Sue and she can distribute it. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. And, and Barry Gray, um, he knows that Prescott Garden Club, they were selling native plants today. Master okay. Gardeners of Erie County, they recently have given talks on native plants. Um, Great. Regional Science Consortium, they every year have a native plant sale and theirs is going on right now. Although Carolyn, I don't know, are they still um, taking orders for them or is it too late to order? I just looked on I just looked on the site for the Regional Science Consortium. I think they're still taking orders until the 21st, but so many categories that I looked at in perennials and shrubs say out of stock. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Barry, so they, I, Barry, I have been, been successful. Mm, yes. Um, Barry, I have a question for you about the Presque Isle Garden Club, where they, they were selling other plants other than natives, right? Can you unmute, Barry? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Mary. Well, so I, I I saw somebody who's a friend of mine on Facebook that was, you know, posting a, about the sale. And and from the pictures I was seeing, all the plants were not native. So I was just curious about the, the ratio, shall we say. If this is the one at Barron, typically they have some natives and it's it's more of a um people bring their home plants and mm -hmm. sale. No, that was last Sunday. That was the master gardener sale at Barron. Yeah. This was, uh, my wife went to the sale today. I'm sure there were non-native plants there as well, but she was mm -hmm. interested in the native plants. Mm Hmm. Yeah, plants um, plant swaps are a great way to go too. Like you're saying, it's hard to get native plant material, and I think it's really helpful to do swaps. You know, that's yep. really helpful. That sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. I've been talking with the people um, who own, who own Sabacchio Park about the possibility of having um, native plants grown out there and and creating some more economic opportunities for the people. That's the um, a minority something investment corporation that to have some kind of economic opportunity for people using that but things are kind of a little bit in flux there right now but I keep keep talking to Gary and Veronica about that possibility yeah yeah I've always wanted to see something good happen at Savacchio Park um 
there there are um, some nice birding opportunities there now, but I think it would be better if, um, and this is an industrial park, um, Heidi, not a, um, a, a you know, res or a recreational park, um, that um, they, there is some, you know, I, I almost always have a kestrel there, Oh. Um, for the Christmas bird count. That's awesome. <laughs> I go to Savacchio Park to get my kestrel. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, and and we have seen a variety of birds there, but it could be way better. It could mm -hmm. be way better. How's the tree canopy there? But they, they um, have a wet, they have a wetland. Oh good. And the wetland is is a lot of overgrown stuff, but there is a wetland, and so they're not going to do anything there, but that's mm -hmm. It could be restored if they had maybe some people and a grant or something to work on it. That's a great idea. How big of a wetlands is it? I don't even know where the wetlands is in there. It's on the kind of the north side. By the tracks. Yeah. Yeah. I that's what I figured. Um I I it, is there Frank Mighty in there? Probably. Probably. Yeah. yeah. And maybe even not we. Uh, yeah, but uh, another another interesting thing, you know, we have earned seed, and they will sell any individual seed in quantities as small as an ounce. That's amazing. I love earned seed. They're you, great. If you get a custom mix, you have to buy a whole pound. But okay. you can get like an ounce of penstemon or an ounce of alimus or something. So. So if people do want to grow native plants, there is that that opportunity. Yeah. Sure, I mean that's a, I think that's something too that um Alan talented too is um not only were they collecting seeds but also buying from ant seed and then you know divvying it up and then you know providing it for free. That would be a great investment into the community is buying you know like you said a pound of seed and then divvying it up you know by little tiny packets yeah. to give out throughout the community because plant material is so expensive and then you know mm -hmm. giving demonstrations of how you plant the seeds you know. How do you take care of it? How do you deal with it? So they have as mm -hmm. much success as possible. So right, yeah. Because yeah. I I need help with germinating seeds because I don't know enough. It's challenging, yeah, it's challenging. But native seeds are pretty easy to germinate. I mean, they're much easier than you know our non-natives and exotic plants for the most part. And well, it's some not you know, but yeah, I think demonstrations are important. Yeah, yeah. Prescott Audubon last year Earth Day 2022, we bought a pound of. Um, seeds or a couple pounds, I forget, and put them into um, little envelopes with directions on how to uh, grow them and then handed it out for Earth Day. So I, that's, I would, awesome. yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Maybe we'll do that again. I don't know. We, we got things. I got to think about these different things that we could do. Yeah, there's just yeah. so many things to do. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's hard. It's hard to focus. You're doing so much great stuff out there, though. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and 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 we've had to acknowledge as a chapter that you know there's there's only so much we can do because yeah. there's only so many of us, and right. we can't we can't <laughs> we can't go too far or else we're all just gonna curl up in little balls in the corner. <laughs> and... No, I agree. One thing that came to mind, I thought, but this was really impressive, is um, one of my bird towns in Solberry Township. They decided just to have a theme for the year, so they're focusing on raptors this year. You know, just something to think about focusing is maybe just one year, focus on one thing, like, you know, focus on bird window collisions for the year, focus on cats, you know, dealing with cats, just maybe focusing on maybe one or two goals for the year instead of trying to do everything so it doesn't drive yourself crazy, you know. Yeah. So, just well, a thought. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time, Heidi. I know you're really a busy woman. I really appreciate oh, it. Fun. That was so fun. So thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to spend the evening with you guys. I love all the questions and love hearing all about the amazing work you're doing. And, um, you know, let me know if I can help in any way. Okay. All right. and say hello to the Red Knots for me. I will. I will. You guys listen, have a great weekend. Thanks again. And I'll, I'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.